Hello, and welcome to the Birch of Salmon Net Zero podcast. My name is Tom Hewitt, and I lead the Food, Farming and Land Group at Birch of Salmon. In today's podcast, I'll be speaking to Joanna Knight, a state surveyor for Dyson Farming Limited, the largest in-hand farming business in the country and probably the first large-scale commercial farm in Britain to be carbon neutral. We'll be speaking about how Dyson Farming are managing the future challenges facing farmers today. And of course, a key challenge is the government's target for net zero by 2050. Currently, agriculture emits 10% of the UK's annual greenhouse gas emissions. Hi, Joanna, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Tom. No, it's, it's an absolute pleasure and thank you for having me. Uh, I think this is a really fascinating and challenging time to be involved in farming and the ownership of land. Uh, we're on the cusp of what's sometimes called the fourth agricultural revolution, driven by technology and data. Uh, we've got targets for net zero, as well as that other very immediate crisis in biodiversity. And at the same time, we are seeing the withdrawal of the basic payment scheme, that key support payment for farmers. And as yet, it's largely unclear what its replacement ELMS, Environmental Land Management Scheme, will look like and how generous, generous will it be? Um, how are you seeing these challenges at Dyson Farming and how are you dealing with them? Yeah, I think, you know, there, there's some really great statements there. And I think, you know, really for the industry as a whole, it's actually a very exciting time to be involved in agriculture. Um, whilst there are some very clear challenges, which you've, you've really sort of outlined there, I think there's also some really great opportunities, um, certainly for those within the industry that's sort of quite open to, um, to embrace change, which I think is a sort of a very important aspect of this transition, really. Um, talking more for Dyson Farming, um, we've prepared, been preparing for quite some time, certainly with investments in soils and um, environmental stewardship. Um, and obviously, you know, sort of the core infrastructure of the farming enterprise. Um, and this has really been going on since Sir James Dyson started buying the land. Um, yes, I think there's a huge transitional shift um, with the reduction in BPS. And this is a really very challenging concept for the industry. Um, the government has started to outline more about what ELMS will look like, the environmental land management schemes, um, particularly with the sustainable farming incentive, which is coming through um, as of next year. Um, but clearly from this, there's still a long way to go. Um, and as a business, we've always walked, wa worked towards um, having a business model that um, didn't include the BPS receipts. Um, I think certainly um, from this perspective of carbon and biodiversity, um, it's certainly becoming more prominent within the industry. Um, but, you know, the challenge is, is still understanding that. Um, and in relative terms, it's complex um, and it requires a different approach and mindset. Um, so particularly with carbon, um, you know, this is an area that I think farmers have received quite a lot of scrutiny, um, certainly more recently. But actually, let's not forget that, um, you know, some of the key answers actually are within the industry itself, um, certainly in achieving some of the net zero targets um, and beyond that. And I know you, you, you uh, as a business, are, are carbon neutral, and I think that's pretty unusual amongst large commercial farms. What, what, how are you different then from other large commercial farms? And what enables you to to to, to claim that rosette? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if we're necessarily any different from any other commercial farms, and obviously, I I can't talk for um, any of the farmers out there. Um, but certainly, from from our perspective, um, there's a lot of work being going on in terms of. Um, collating our natural capital account. So myself and a colleague um, work very closely on that. And we've spent a considerable amount of time actually understanding what we have. Um, certainly from the perspective of carbon, um, I think it's really important not only to understand your emissions, um, but also the, um, the sequestration element. Um, and often or not, you find that actually um, they're, they're looked at in se separate pieces, um, but actually you've got to look at it in the round. And we, we spent a lot of time doing this um, and really understanding that and and effectively creating a baseline for ourselves to benchmark internally in the future so you know it's difficult for me to sort of um compare to what others are doing but that's that's certainly what we've been spending our time um concentrating on 
And, and you mentioned data there, uh, Joanna, and obviously data collection is 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 going to be key to many aspects of of of, of future land management. Is it one of the difficulties we've got at the moment that there isn't a common measurement, whether it's in soil health, which has got really particular challenges, but also biodiversity or or natural capital? So you know, the data you're collecting now, will it sort of translate into whatever DEFRA may say is the necessary metric for for elms in the future or, or, or issues like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think data is key um, and it's it's fundamental to any business. Um, again, a considerable amount of work that we do, in fact, all of the work that we do, whether it's sort of farm, estate, property management, um, it all really points to the same thing. And, and that's really the need for a central platform um, somewhere that enables efficient data collection um, and the ability to benchmark not only for ourselves internally, but also externally in the future. Um, being consistent and what in what data we have um, there are so many different management systems out there and obviously you know what system you use as a business is is a, is a decision that you make um, because that's that's most suited to what your um, your structure is but that the amount of management systems and softwares are out there um, without even considering Excel, which is obviously um, you know, a huge, huge base for, for collating data, um, it can really be quite overwhelming. Um, and I think a lot of these systems, they, you know, they need Excel to bring them together. Um, but it really, for us, it's as as we've been on this journey, it's really sort of highlighted the incompatibility sometimes of the available systems. Um, and there's lots of frustrations out there. You know, there's, there's duplication and certainly, you know, farmers out there will be all too aware of the multiple audits that we have to go through on an annual basis. And if there was a central data system for that, it would make everything so much slicker and easier and more efficient. Um, you know, and for, for Dyson, certainly with, with carbon accounting, um, if we look at that specifically, um, we actually took the decision to select a specific management tool that suited our business, um, which meant that we were able to internally benchmark. Um, but, you know, the important thing for us at this stage was um, really the direction of travel, not necessarily the answer. So it's always improving, always understanding, um, you know, and gaining better understanding of where we are as a business. I think one of the things that interests us as lawyers is the question of ownership of data and that that's being talked about increasingly in terms of whether you're tied to a particular provider of software or your tractor or your sprayer or whatever is collecting the data, uh, making sure that that data is portable and you're not tied to to, to a particular supplier is, is going to be increasingly important, I think. Absolutely. I, I, th I think it's also right that um, your analysis of your numbers has really revealed to your business how much more you are spending on land stewardship than you're actually receiving in in grants um, and i suppose my question here is in in two parts D do you think and i appreciate you can't speak for other farmers but do you think that's a fairly common position for many farmers but they don't know it because they haven't been able to get into the detail in the way that your analysis has enabled to you to and the second question then is, if it is costing you more than you're receiving, why do you do it? <laughs> yeah, some great questions. I, I think, and you've already sort of really answered it, you know, certainly the first part of that question, it's very difficult, again, for me to, to really comment on other businesses and their business models and, you know, the investment they make. Every, everyone is going to be different, um, you know, even just looking at landscape. So, um, you know, it's going to be very, diff very um, dependent on the business model as to how much and what level of improvement they're going to make in in their infrastructure and investment that, that there is. But for us, it was really important that we understood our position. Um, you know, we have a team that's dedicated to environmental management um, and we needed to have a better understanding of where um, our focus needed to be. Um, so it's, it was really important for us to keep forging forward um, and by understanding where our receipts were, but also where our expenditure was, um, we were able you know, to be in a better position to contribute towards the value um, of environmental and infrastructure management um, you know, and, and delivery and, and what it 
what is required to encourage um, more investment in the future, which is, I think is where, where we're really at with Elms right now. Um, so I think, you know, that was a really important aspect for us to really sort of drill down into that and really understand where the investment was um, and how it's going to contribute um, going forward. Uh, I love that second question. Why do we do it? I think it's a great question. Um, and I think that the genuine and most straightforward answer to that is we do it because we believe it's the right thing to do. Um, it's important for any business um, to have values and stick to them and, and do the right thing. And I think the challenge is really to demonstrate how we can add value. So in the future, this value can be represented um, in the price that we receive. So um, this is really another level of communication to customers and consumers and, and having a food brand in the future will help us with this. Um, but, you know, with no investment, the, the future could look pretty bleak. Um, you know, if we don't invest in our soils, which is fundamental to our, our farming business and the wider environment and the ecosystem and um, just simply won't thrive, um, which is ultimately going to have an impact on crop production and, and wider aspirations for us as a business with carbon and natural capital and, and other things that come from that. So it was really important for us to see the bigger picture. Um, what we do now will benefit many aspects of the, um, the business in the future. Future and importantly, um, you know, come down to, to what the family's aspirations are. And I can see it's a, a really difficult balance to maintain. Um, but ultimately, I guess you're a, a commercial farming business and the withdrawal of the basic payment scheme, the BPS. What, uh, what future do you see then in growing commodity crops, feed wheat, for example, where you can't add value by saying this is a, a Dyson product because the, you know, the cattle that are eating it aren't going to pay a premium price because it's Dyson feed wheat. Um, I can honestly say uh, that I think that the, the future is positive. Um, as I sort of adhered to earlier, um, there's going to be there's going to be a need for mindset change. Um, and ultimately, businesses are going to have to look harder at farming businesses are going to have to look harder at um, productive land and less productive land. Um, so, for example, with Dyson Farming, we have a hall of shame. Um, so this is across all of our farmed land. And um, so it analyzes the performance in terms of yield. Um, and then we can literally rank um, best to worst um, fields. And, and this really facilitates future um, management decisions that we can make in terms of crop production, but then sort of future land management as well. So producing commodity crops is really a big part of what we do. Um, we're on a journey to preserve the, the identity of our crops and as they pass through the food chain. So there will need to be a closer collaboration, um, certainly with the end user um, through direct sales, um, which will be really important, um, certainly in preserving identity, quality, but also our environmental standards as well. I think land use change will happen in places. Um, but this, there is still, you know, a requirement for quality food production. Um, and I think this can only be really highlighted as to where we've been um, nationally and globally, where, you know, where we've been over the last 18 months with the impact of COVID. Um, I, I do actually think that there's still a, a considerable gap between um, the understanding of farming and the contributions it makes and where the public perception lies. Um, and I think, you know, it's really up to us as an industry to try and close that gap. Um, and I, I sort of, you know, I think as a great example, if you haven't watched it, um, and if you have the, the Clarkson Farming Show, it's, it's definitely um, showing that actually, you know, it's got the, it's got a, a good message across. And, and hopefully not only is it, it touch people within the industry, but outside as well. And, and don't buy a Lamborghini tractor. <laughs> definitely <the> not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it is interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm looking out the window here at an a, 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 a awkwardly shaped field of winter wheat with, with black grass swaying in the wind above it. And uh, I think it'll be very interesting to see whether in the future uh, this is it, it still grows it grows wheat or whether it's 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 that the farmer concludes that it's a, a marginal field and he can concentrate on more productive fields and and uh, do something more profitable with with this this rather rather oddly shaped and and uh, not not in very good heart uh, field. But anyway, that 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 time yeah. will tell on that. 
I, I think certainly, you know, with that, um, it, it is important to sort of um, highlight the fact that, you know, the, the technology is out there and it's coming. Um, and, um, you know, there, there will be change, but I, I genuinely do believe that there is a positive future. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've got to just keep going with that, definitely. And, and you mentioned technology, and of course, Dyson is, is best known as a technology company, or at least the name Dyson is best known as a technology company. And one of the key aspects we're going to see is this huge upgrading of technology in, in farming with AI and so on. Is there an overlap between what you do in Dyson Farming and and uh, what 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 the, the, the tech side of the business is doing? Yeah, I think you know uh, one of the sort of the key aspects of of um, the 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 sort of link between Dyson Farming and and Dyson Technology is our recent name change. So previously we were known as Beeswax Dyson Farming. Um, that's now changed to Dyson Farming. Um, and I think this just highlights the synergy that that's sort of taking place between the farming enterprise and the, and the wider Dyson group. Um, you know, there there is um, increasingly more engagement. I, I can't go into it in too much detail, but I, I think there will be more to come in the future. Um, certainly for Dyson, you know, just to give it a bit of a flavour, um, we Dyson Farming produce the lamb, potato, strawberries, and peas that all go down to the um, the canteens in in the Dyson Tech um, setup wow. down in Malmesbury. So there's a link there, and and there's more communication, um, and you know. There will, there will be more in the future. So it's exciting. Oh, well, how interesting. Gosh, I think I nearly had a scoop there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we repeated this conversation in 10 years' time, what, what visible improvements do you think I might see, not necessarily just out of my window, but, but driving around, or, or perhaps the less visible improvements, the, the soil health improvements, which, of course, you know, that, that, that are less obvious to the naked eye? What, what do you think, uh, what, what would you like? and hope to see in the in in the Dyson farming estate so I think in 10 years time um you know we'll have uh, got a well-established baseline in terms of our soils biodiversity our carbon efforts and and have an annual accounting reports in place um which will contribute to the wider business model um I think that well I hope that there will be a consistent um, and clear measurement tool system out there for collating the data, um, not just for us as a business, but for the wider industry. Um, and, you know, this will really be able to facilitate um, future benchmarking. Certainly, you know, the, there's obviously a lot more to come in terms of carbon markets, biodiversity net gain. Um, but actually, until we can get there, we need some some level of consistency within the industry. Um, so I think, you know, the, the data collected will be able to show how we've improved as a business um, with our management. Um, and then, you know, we'd like to think at that point we will have um, increased our loyal customer base um, who are enjoying our food and supporting our, um, you know, our, our approach to a more regenerative agricultural system. And I suppose one of the, the interesting things about technology is that it promises perhaps a kinder uh, type of uh, farming with not blanket application of, of herbicide, but a selective application. And all these things could be very beneficial for biodiversity, perhaps. So I guess uh, that, that, that it, so many of these developments are pointing in the same direction, I think. Mean. Absolutely, you know the, the the technology is there and it's coming, um, and that's the really exciting bit of it of of the industry. And I think, you know, when it gets here and progresses, um, you know, we will see more change. Um, and I think we we can only be anything but positive and and um, learn and understand better um, and and continue to improve. Um, so uh, I strongly believe the future is bright. It just looks different. Well, Joanna, thank you so much. That's been really interesting and, and great to hear your very positive view of how the future is going to look. Um, I think we should put in the diary uh, a meeting in 10 years time <laughs> and, and see how it's uh, whether, whether predictions come true. But I think it's, it, it's nice to hear such a, a positive view of the future. Thank you for joining right. us. No, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Burgess Salmon Net Zero podcast. If you'd like to know more about our Net Zero approach and how our experts can work with you, 
you can contact me or any of the team via our website. If you enjoyed this podcast, you may also enjoy listening to our previous episode, Net Zero Challenges and Opportunities, which is available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you again for listening. <laughs>